So today is Brian Koberger Day. Um, the letter is uh, where he was uh, cut loose. He was let go. And uh, there's some other stuff. Um, I have a special discussion concerning the balloons that have been shot down. Uh, one balloon confirmed over the Atlantic Ocean and then two other uh, unnamed objects, one in Canada, one over Alaska, I believe. So I have, um, I have a fun and interesting little video for that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, after this video, I'm going to talk about uh, the Murdoch housekeeper because she is so much more than that and a very interesting person um, and very sad that, uh, you know. Anyway, uh, Koberger, his uh, uh, WSU termination letter, and bear with me just one second. Okay, uh, anyway, so uh, the letter starts out, this is from WSU, Mr. Koberger, I am writing this letter to formally inform you of the termination of your teaching assistantship with the Department of Criminal Justice and, Justice and Criminology effective December 31st, 2022. So this would be after, about a month after the uh, murders. In keeping with the WSU Graduate Student Handbook Chapters 9G2 and 12E3, below is a list of events that led to you being deficient on the following contingent, contingency clause of your funding. Maintaining satisfactory progress in fulfilling assistantship service requirements and duties. This is what I was waiting for. On September 23rd, 2022, you had an altercation with the faculty you support as a TA, Professor Snyder. I met with you on October 3rd to discuss norms of professional behavior. On October 21st, Professor Snyder emailed you about the ways in which you had failed to meet your expectations as a TA thus far in the semester. As a result, on November 2nd, Graduate Director Willits and I met with you to discuss an improvement plan, which you agreed to and I shared with you in an email dated November 3rd. We met again on December 7th, this time with Professor Snyder as well as Dr. Willits and I to discuss your progress on the improvement plan. While not perfect, we agreed that there was progress. On December 9th, there was another altercation with Professor Snyder, in which it became apparent that you had not made progress regarding professionalism and about which I wrote to you on December 11th, requesting a meeting. We met on December 19th when I informed you of your termination as a TA <coughs> for spring semester. Um, former FBI agent Jennifer Coffendaffer said that the details outlined in the letter could have triggered Koberger. And this article is in News Nation online. Okay, and it says that um, it it cites, uh, I guess Banfield is a News Nation uh, anchor, I, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, it said that he was given the, uh, the letter exclusively. Um, so <clears throat> it would not answer why he did this, Coffin Daffer told, told host Ashley Banfield on Wednesday night's Banfield. Oh, it's Ashley Banfield. Okay, I know that I know she is an anchor. Okay, it would explain why he chose the time to do this losing a job, potentially losing your income, 
the embarrassment of losing your position, maybe even having your dream of being a PhD in Jeopardy. These would all be triggering factors to propel you into doing something this heinous combined with his true reasoning from deep inside himself. I beg to differ. I don't think this had anything to do with the murders. Um, I, you know, I doubt he was embarrassed. I doubt he had, he probably had rage because, um, you know, people don't like criticism in general. People are very um, resistant to <laughs> criticism. And I mean, you know, he, I don't know. I think he was acting and behaving this way. It was just my opinion. Just from act, having um, serial killers and mass murderers to reference, it's my opinion that his discharge from this job is actually part of uh, the result of where his head was at. Not the other way around. I don't think this triggered him. I think he was already in that headspace. Everything was building up and he was getting to that point where he his his outlet was gonna be to kill. So, you know, it looks like he was discharged after the murders, but it seems like they had some problems leading up to that, uh, going back to September and October, um, and then November, and, and then again on December. So November 2nd. They met so I but I don't think this was a this was leading to the killing I think this was part of uh, his behavior result uh, resulting in this coming about um, and the murders too so you know the only real deep dive I've done on a serial killer was Edward Surratt and I did several hearts because the deep dive was so deep and he wasn't he's not a really uh popular serial killer not really talked about that much from western pa in the 70s um but there's a lot of information on him uh and his behavior and even himself because he lived to talk about it um and was asked, but, and his wife, he was married and he lived with his wife and she had really interesting and important things to contribute to building this 3D picture of Edward Surratt, who was intelligent, who served in the military, uh, two different branches, um, in the Marine Corps during Vietnam um, and there's conflicting stories on him, I think, because he was not as well known as others, but I dug deep. I actually paid for information and um, newspapers and articles and uh, things like that, because once I started the deep dive into him, a lot of things became clear um, about him and his killing. And before he killed, his wife can can has even said in interviews and whatnot that he had this agitate period of agitation and so during this period of agitation he would get into fights he would get into altercations um verbal or he was less tolerant um and then he would just get up and take off from the house and wouldn't tell her where he was going and then he would go out and kill and then she didn't know that at the time, but then he would come back and he would dive into religion and, you know, uh, go to two services per day or whatever. But, you know, kind of, he was a very intelligent man, um, but he started to go off the rails um, during college. I think uh, when he first got out of high school, he had, he had some, some kid trouble. Uh, in high school and, and dropped out and then his parents encouraged him to go back. 
he went back, he graduated, and then they encouraged him to go to college. And he started college, but didn't finish. Um, and, you know, I think the unsettling, the, the changes in the mind, the brain, because there are witnesses that knew him in school, said he was just a super, he was just a great guy. He was just fun. And he had a friend that was like a lifelong friend that he ran into when he was in the military. And this guy was a corpsman and then on and on and on. And still to the day after he was con convicted of murders and whatnot, when this guy came to the prison to see him um, and he was it's in law enforcement by that time and he sat down with him and Surratt was like their connection was cool. You know, he's like, hey, buddy, how are you? How you doing? And, and you know, their relationship. And as soon as his longtime friend brought up the murders, he like this dark veil, you know, dropped over uh, Surratt. And he didn't want to talk about it, especially to his friend. He didn't want to talk about it. So um, and in prison, he's involved in religion. It's like Buddhism. I keep forgetting, but he's in a, a, a an ancient form of uh, a spiritual religion that's very popular. It's very well known, and he's been involved in that in prison since, you know, almost immediately, you know, within a few years of being incarcerated. And um, so, but... But so when I read this letter and I see where he had these troubles kind of leading up to the murders, uh, I don't think it's it, it, it's it's a leap of faith to think that this would trigger him to do these mass murders. I don't believe that. I believe that this is a symptom of his particular murderous intentions. And if he, in fact, is the murderer, I got to say that because we don't know for sure until it comes out, you know, everything comes out in court. But um, that's all I got to say on the on the Koberger thing. Um, I just want to click on this article real quick. I haven't read it before. Another Banfield article, Surviving Idaho Roommate Thought Noise Was Party. And this was on February 9th, okay, February 9th, not long ago. Um, she thought the noise resulted from partying, asked the victims to quiet down, and mistook the killer as a guest. Um, the source spoke directly with the surviving roommate, Dylan Mortensen, who allegedly yelled about the noises heard during the killings because she mistook it for partying. She said, calm down, you're being too loud, I'm trying to sleep, around 4 a.m. She closed her door, locked it. Um, later in the night, she heard more loud noises. She opened her door. She saw the killer walking down the hall, but she wasn't frightened. She assumed he was a guest of the other roommates. Uh, They're partying, um, and that's all according to this source. So, was she a witness frozen in shock? Or did she think he was a party guest? Because the affidavit said that she opened the door to find a man clad in black clothing and a mask with bushy eyebrows, frozen shock face, and that the man walked toward the sliding glass door and she locked herself in her room and said she didn't recognize him. So what, what is it? Could it be the affidavit um, misinterpreted what was said by the roommates? Because it wasn't just Dylan Mortensen, there was the other roommate too that, that you know. And the affidavit, I believe, also said that the two girls were down in the basement apartment, the two surviving girls. So... I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what happens here. Um, because it, 
Yeah, the girls murdered were on the second and third floor. And then there's like, first it was Chapin that was killed in the doorway of Kernodal's room, and then it was Kernodal killed in the doorway. Um, we know that she ordered a uh, DoorDash or takeout or something like that. So more than likely she was uh, awake and he was probably awake. Um, I don't know if they found any food in the room. You know, was that followed up? The, the order that they made um, from DoorDash or did they get that order? Or was Brian Koberger moonlighting as a DoorDash person that night and he intercepted the order um, and took it there and that was his in into the house? Um, I don't know. You know, a lot of people moonlight with DoorDash and Uber and and um, the, all of those services where they bring food to your door, uh, groceries to your door, things like that, give you a ride. So, you know, it's possible. I don't know how, I'm sure they would have uncovered that by now. Are they keeping that a secret? Are they not revealing that? Because, you know, they kind of drop talking about anything on this case, but as far as him, like, laying in wait, hiding in the woods, already in the house. That was my first theory, was that he was already in the house. And, um, you know, they, because he killed the, supposedly the first two on the top floor. And he wasn't wearing gloves? Or was he wearing gloves? If he wasn't wearing gloves, because that's how they got the print on the, uh, on the button of the sheath, the knife sheath. That was under or beside one of the girls' bodies upstairs on the in the third apartment, third bedroom up above. So, you know, he's holding the sheath and he rips out the knife. And in the flurry, he drops it. And <clears throat> there's so much chaos and blood. And perhaps he his uh, brain went blank, went dark, you know. And he was just in that, that uh, murderous uh, rage or that murderous um, nope, if there was any rage. Uh, Ed Surratt didn't have any rage. It was just an urge to rape, to kill, to strangle. Because he would walk in, he'd break into a home, blast him with a shotgun, blast the man with a shotgun. He did recon, he did surveillance, so he knew pretty much what he was going to get when he broke into a home. Um, and he used to, like initially was able to open doors, this uh, Ed Surratt, open doors, they were unlocked. Um, and then once news spread that there was a, a serial killer on the loose in Western PA, they people started locking their doors, so he started... Uh, he'd ride his bicycle and do recon around these neighborhoods, um, and he would pick, or he'd walk, you know, he would pick uh, a one-story house. He made sure there was, uh, like, glass uh, on the door where he could smash the glass, the back door, and unlock it and just come in. Two people there. Um, and he probably knew, like, the one that couple that he murdered... The man was a, a quadriplegic or paraplegic in a wheelchair, Vietnam veteran, and the woman. And he observed, probably observed them, and there was nobody else there. And so he broke in, yanked the phone cord, fired the shotgun into the guy, killing him instantly, grabbing the woman. And he had a tendency to drag the woman outside of the home and would kill them outside of the home, strangle them and rape them. And um, But he's he'd also done... Uh, a murder in a, a lover's lane, um, young girl, young guy, um, or killed him right there in the van, took off with the girl, and so on and so forth. So, but he wasn't experiencing rage, whatever it was that he felt like he, and the Vietnam War did not create him as a killer. I think the Vietnam was his first, in fact, he had pictures up in his prison cell, first kill, 
surrounded by his buddies from Vietnam. Um, I think he discovered that murder was a re was a release, you know, for him. That that's what all this anxiety and this turmoil that he was having, this unsettled, you know, feeling. Um, and I think you you know you would have to talk to someone who just specifically studies these uh, serial killers, but. I see some correlations with Ed Surratt with some other more famous serial killers. Um, but Brian Koberger, um, I can, I can more kind of see the two of them, Koberger and Surratt, um, in their behavior wise, I can kind of see that. So that's why I personally don't think that, that his, um, his behavior leading up to the murders was a trigger. Instead, it was uh, a part of uh, his particular um, whatever you want to call it, his particular um, headspace. Um, you know that this this unsettledness, this you know, little bits of uh, confrontations and like Surratt, this building um, agitation. Maybe that's that's what I think, but that's really all I got to say about Koberger. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens when he finally gets into court and all that.